software. So let's uh, talk more about it. So folks may remember that during our, our last lecture, we talked about some broad issues in uh, test design. There, it stayed a little bit at a higher level. Today, we're going to get down to nitty gritty. Last time we talked about things like regression tests and the role the regression tests play. We talked some about automated testing versus manual testing, right? Um, uh, we talked about this V model of testing, right? Where we had different levels of needs in our system, different levels of planning that goes into the system from requirements all the way down to low level design. And that was kind of matched in a rough way by different levels of testing. And we noted last time that these different levels of testing are undertaken often by different parties. Like who's responsible for unit tests uh, predominantly in, a te in, in the team? Developer. Yeah, the developers, um, particularly if, as is the case here, you want to see developers using test-driven development. You know, unit tests are part of that, right? It's a, it's a key part. Before you write the code, you write the tests, right? Um, those might not be all the tests that are ever written. Testers might kick in some unit tests that, you know, somehow got missed in the shuffle and so on, but it's overwhelmingly developer side. By contrast, system tests, integration tests, uh, integration tests are kind of in the middle. A lot of developers write those, some testers. System tests and acceptance tests are really the province of, of, of testers. Um, and at the same time, they might use make me might make use of development resources. Like the APIs written by developers are used by system tests that don't go through the UI. Remember we talked last time? It was up on this side of the board. There are some tests that go through the UI, you know, as if someone were typing in, it's just driven by Selenium or something. Mm -hmm. By contrast, there's also other system tests, which are similarly, you know, written by code, I just like you might write code in Selenium. <coughs> there's code written for tests that put the system through use cases uh, by calling off API functions. It might be the, the rough areas of the code that we invoked if you press buttons in the UI and did this or did that. It's gonna make under the surface a bunch of calls to the API to say, update the model, the model information or update the view or whatever. And you can have code that does the same. So system tests you know, exist in a couple of different ways, but um, Generally, a lot of them are automated. And then there might be some manual system tests that are you know, running use cases manually. And that's really good to get a feel for system weakness or softness in certain areas. Um, areas where it's, it's not really uh, keeping up with things or there's long delays or there's, uh, you know, there's kind of a weird result that you weren't expecting, and maybe it turns out to be right, but you're wondering maybe if you push it a bit further, it will break. And tester's job is to try to break it. Um, and then acceptance tests. So again, testing is its own discipline. Um, some people can get really, really good at testing, and they're like an order of magnitude better than you know, a developer testing their own code. Developers are sympathetic often to their code. They want to show it works. So they often will, you know, show, oh, well, it's working on this and it's working on that, and it's working on that. Isn't that great? And that's good. But testers often approach it a bit of a different way. They get excited about breaking code. Let's see if we can break this. And there's some famous teams in the history of, of industrial software development that were really, really good as tester teams. There was, there was one team at IBM called the Black Team, and they, they dress all in black. And uh, developers would have to submit the code, 
to the black team. And uh, it was often accompanied by a cackle from the black team folks and so on. And they take in the software and they would break it. Um, often they would break it very quickly. Uh, they just kind of ferret out clever cases to try and 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 they kind of smelled, you know, smell that's getting suspicious if again it was uh, really uh, lagging in some case or wasn't refreshing properly, quite properly. They'd see if they could boil it down to something simple that would just like crack it or make it do something wacko, you know, halt it. Make it freeze, right? Or make it crash or make it show gibberish on the screen or whatever. And they got they were super good at it and they were feared by developers. And as a result, developers put in extra time to make their code extra robust. It's not good if they have an adverse relationship with testers, but if it helps helps them realize their code's not going to get through, you know, un, untested, it's important. Now we talked about automated testing before. I made some informal comments um, that I don't want to spend much time on. I'll, I'll just note that it has some real trade-offs. We talked about some of them before. I think Ram 10 had mentioned some. You know, you can get a really rapid testing and retesting, right? Like if you have a test suite that's automated, someone goes, fixes, tries to fix a bug. Remember, we talked about this fault feedback ratio. Anyone remember what that is? Yeah, Jeremy. Yeah, yeah, and you know it's like eighty percent for really big chunks of code, and it's like fifty percent for even smaller chunks of code. It's not the fault feedback ratio. And imagine, therefore, you know when you fix a bug, it's really important to do tests again because you might have introduced something else. And if you could rerun a whole set of automated tests like that. You know that will keep you honest, right? It'll help help raise confidence. You haven't resurfaced another bug or introduced something that would break the system in obvious ways. And it's one of the reasons you you uh, put in place time to you know run a smoke test and then run a suite of tests. Hopefully, um, it has really low incremental cost in the sense of doing another test is really cheap. Um, and you know you can run it overnight right you don't need testers there sitting all through the night you just run it during the night you could run the whole set of regression tests the whole set of tests that have ever shown above and and rerun it's great that's what we were doing in the late 80s in microsoft is, is you know running these test suites overnight the disadvantage here is you know it's really uh high initial cost and and it's high cost to maintain um, takes time to code up instead of just doing it often. Um, and it's easy to not be aware of the results. This is a key thing. I, I had a student just come to me today. Um, it's actually involving some work with our model. And he was, he had done some modeling and, and he had gone through a whole lot of work to do what's called calibrate the model to sort of align it with data. It lasted a couple of days. And he went to get the results with it, and he realized, wait a minute, the calibration, it actually wasn't writing out the data he expected. It was writing the same data twice instead of writing the correct data. And I said, well, you know, did you, like, like was there something that allowed this to slip through the cracks? What, you know, why is it you didn't notice? And he said, well, I checked that it ran. I checked it ran. And I saw that it outputted, but I, I didn't check what it outputted. And if he had checked, he would have seen those same thing twice, right? Um, and uh, by the same token, like with testing, it's easy not to be aware of the results. Like, okay, you run a test, it ran, it didn't crash. And a lot of students think, okay, great, ship it. You know, like, it's ready to be submitted. But I mean, that's a really low bar, right? I mean, hopefully your program actually does something meaningful, like it outputs meaningful results, not just, it doesn't just run and finish, which is pretty weak, you know? Um, so when you run tests, 
you know, um, you should be making sure they don't just run. They run and you should check, you know, did they pass? Some years ago, we had um, a set of uh, students who were very involved in the CSSS as a member of the team. This was gosh, in 2008, 2009 or something. It was quite early. And um, the class that year was really small for whatever reason. So we had one team. And they decided they would build a system to maintain the library and the lockers over in space for C triple S. I don't know if you know folks know C triple S, the computer science student society for undergrads, right? Um, and so they have these lockers up in space and and they have books you can borrow and stuff like that. Anyway, um so uh so they make this, this system for, for maintaining lockers and so on. And uh, they were testing this, and they gave me reports on the test results. And um, on the face of it, it looked great. You know, it, it ran up like, I don't know, 30 tests. This was like ID 2 or something. ID 3. I guess. It ran 30 tests, and, you know, they showed the results. And all of them said three thumbs up. Like was was the result, you know? Like it's passed. The test passed. The test passed. I thought, great. Okay, that's fantastic. Let me just look at the output from the test. And I looked, and like eighty percent of them said, like could not log in, could not log in, could not log in. So the test ran. It didn't crash, but I mean, it couldn't even log into the system to test it. So all it did was say, like. Three thumbs up. Like I ran. Like <laughs> I didn't crash. It was it was ludicrous, right? I mean, what sort of test is that? They don't even log into the system to try it out, right? Um, so this is one of the dangers with automated tests. If you have a person manually testing, they're gonna notice if something goes wrong, right? Mm -hmm. like, Wacko is sleep deprived or something. They're going to notice if something goes wrong. The wrong answer shows up, or or it it just you know doesn't give the right result. But with a with an automated test, you might not notice. If you say three thumbs up, right? And you know it's nonsense. I mean, you got to check check the results of your test. Just like when a build runs, make sure the build succeeds. Don't just make sure it ran because that's that doesn't mean much. Um, and then there's high ongoing costs. We talked about how automated tests break, or, or they break as the system evolves. We have to maintain them, we have to sort of bring them along and make sure the tests still are still meaningful. During my last deliverable, both teams gave me a test matrix, right? right? You have you have different test cases, right? This is like test case one, test case two, maybe it's arranged in the transpose of this, whatever it is. Um, blah, blah, blah. And then you have maybe features or requirements along here, right? Um, so these might be, you know, features that are being tested or use cases or requirements. Um, they differ a lot, but you have test cases which, you know, fill in for each other, right? But over time, what's in place for your system feature wise is different. You know, the system evolves, right? Um, maybe it evolves because of stakeholder involvement. Maybe it evolves because, you know, certain things just uh, were planned that it would be elaborated and it was an intermediate set towards it originally. But sometimes what you find is some of these test cases eventually don't make sense. Like, There'll be a test case that used to serve a purpose for a feature which is now deprecated because it's been replaced by a more full feature like that or more sophisticated feature. And so a given test case, a given test case might uh, might no longer be, be relevant. And you should deprecate this test case. It doesn't make sense to run it, get, get rid of it, because it's not serving a purpose, right? It, 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 it had a purpose once, but now it doesn't. Um, and you should document the test purpose. 
Like, in order to figure out what this test tests, you shouldn't have to look at the test code. Mm -hmm. And if you're running a manual test, you shouldn't have to just look at the steps and say, oh, I, I guess it tests this. It should be pretty obvious. Check the results of the test. And, you know, as far as automated testing, there's a set of these things that are really good. Smoke test, whose well, job it is to make sure the system is sane. That's a basic thing. But stress and load test we talked about last time, right? Um, starving the system of memory or disk space or IO, you know, like slow network or, or what have you. Um, slow, really slow processor. Those are stress tests. Low tests would be where we have large numbers of users. So smoke tests, stress and load tests, regression tests, configuration tests that is running on different configurations, highly uh, correctly, highly tedious tests, things that involve just, it will be just horrible tests, someone to go do it. Um, uh, and, and, you know, running, running these things in an automated way is advisable. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so testing candidates, you know, code coverage is another one. Like, it would be crazy to do code coverage manually, right? Try to try to go to every feature in the system. Human intensive tests, you know, it's things like simulations that you tested automatically. They're just a bunch of rules applied again and again, not typical calculations. This is real great to just feel really good for kind of systematic. Systematic software testing is a bit old now, but it's it's a classic. Okay. Um, so that's about automated versus manual. Any questions about? Before I go on to get down to some nitty gritty testing, like specific ways to to pick your tests, to pick your test cases, to stretch, uh, to, to make sure your system is 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 working, and to try to break it and and ferret out weaknesses, if, so you can improve uh, and vulnerabilities. Any questions about what I've just talked about with automated? All you folks will be responsible for automated and manual testing. So I'm assuming this means something to you and the idea of checking the results of tests is, is meaningful. And you know what things you might lead for manual testing and what things you test in an automated way. Presumably those are directly relevant for your plan testing modes. Yes. Uh, so mm -hmm. I like someone is doing the so, like, um, so that's a good question. Often that's a tester responsibility. Um, and, you know, it depends a little bit on the programming language. Um, I mean, if I were a developer of a really key algorithm in, in a piece of software, I might do, I'd certainly do some profiling on it to test. So, so have you folks covered profiling in other classes? Uh, no? Okay. So, so profiling is a, is a tool, it's been around for decades, uh, but it's become a lot easier to pursue in recent years. Um, recent, past decade, really. Um, and it involves basically looking at, at resource use in your program and particularly uh, running your program in a kind of special mode where you can track how much time is being taken by different areas of your program or different areas of your code. Like how much time it's spending in this area of your code versus that one versus that one versus that one. That's one area that it focuses on. Another one is where it's using memory, like which areas of the code are allocating a great deal of memory, because you might be able to lessen how much memory um, there they need to allocate. Uh, that may be a real problem. Um, you might spot exceptions occurring that are high, but they're really slowing their system down. And so you can really pinpoint bottlenecks. This is important because look, 
As developers, it takes more time to write code that's super efficient. It takes more time and effort. And you want to put that effort into the bottlenecks. You don't want to put it into anywhere because I mean, it would be kind of like, I don't know, um, if, if you were, if you had a, a car to drive, it'd uh, be like widening your driveway to be five lane driveway. Like that's not going to help you materially get faster to where you're going. That's not the bottleneck, right? Um, the bottleneck is something else. Um, and in, in general, when we have a slow system, it's not, it's not that every piece of it is equally responsible. Often there's like 20% of it that's taking 80% of the time. Or something like that. It's called the Pareto principle. And often it's disproportionate. Sometimes it's just like two functions in it that are taking the most time. Or the need to, because all these exceptions are being generated by this one area. Or the fact that it's writing tons of things to disk or putting tons of things out over the network that could really be reduced. But the question is, with limited time as developers, where do you put your effort? And you know, the answer should be you put it into the things that matter. You put in the time and effort to the things where you know it really pays off, where you get back to your work, where each hour you spend can really make it faster. And to do that, you use profile. You use you run a profile, and developers generally use profilers more than testers okay because because they're trying to understand like is my code going to be a bottleneck and if so which parts of it and if i change this and change that how much have i improved that's normally the province of developers but testers would be involved on the side of looking for memory leaks looking, but most commonly to be looking you know over time if i run the system for overnight is it using a lot more memory in the morning? And that might not be the result of any one piece of it that a, develop, a given developer is responsible for. It might be the result of interaction between pieces. You know, something freed up, something allocated in developer A's area is not getting freed up by developer B's area. So developer A might study their little bit of code and find it fine. Developer B might study their little code, but they have to play together nicely, right? Maybe developer B thinks developer A is taking care of freeing up the memory or whatever, or releasing the file and allocating. And so often it's testers' job to deal with these system issues. They come, they bring multiple developers, you know, contributions together, and they they form issues. So this is often the province of, of testers. Um, and testers uh, would be responsible for the load and the stress test. Uh, they'd be and, and often it's it's specialized product. Um, back in the day, there was a thing called canned heat that I mentioned, which basically would would make your programs think that system resources were really low. So you could say, make it think it's out of memory. And, and when I try to allocate memory, it would fail. And then you want to make sure it fails gracefully, right? It doesn't just crash or it doesn't just give a stack dump and give up the ghost or it doesn't just hang. It, it, should, it should do something, even if it puts out a message like, you know, um, not enough memory available, you know, please, um, please restart this program when fewer other programs are, are, are running or something like that. But what you don't want to do is write corrupt data. That's the most important thing. That will destroy the data that you have. So you want to avoid writing bad data and you want to have some sort of graceful indicator. So stress and load tests are normally automated and they're part of the toolkit of, of uh, the testers. Um, but you might look like in terms of load on your system or in terms of the uh, amount of memory available, you know, they might run like a given system overnight and see has the amount of memory allocated to it really increased. Okay. They might make sure the developers know that. Um, I mean, they would, right? If, if it's really increased 
maybe then the testers would run a profiler and say this area of the program is just it's allocated you know 20 gigs of memory let's go talk to developers about that and figure out what's going on and so they take it to the developers and the developers are held to account and they gotta go figure out what's what's going on with that so sometimes a bit of a back and forth but profilers can be used on both sides more normally they're used by developers what's used by the testers are often um tools for stress and load testing as well as uh for you know both, then we look at resource use by the program as a whole don't have to do the you know specific sub areas of the program that are the problems as well hope that's any other questions about this? Great question. Great question. Any other questions? Okay, so do I want to see some stress testing? Yes. You folks are doing mobile apps and devices. Load tests aren't quite as big a thing, but at least one group, both groups, right? If you're dealing with systems that are in some sense collaborative, um, less so the, the missing missing kids one, um, or the you know support for, for uh, uh, youth at risk, um, a bit less so there, although it includes chat functionality. 20 people or 40 people chatting and it won't be ground to a halt or something like that. Um, but, the folks who are entering data on nutrition, on you know childcare menus, yeah, I mean load tests will be pretty darn relevant. If you have a bunch of people entering a team of five, you don't want it to be working incredibly slowly because speed, speed, speed is what I heard. That's not from developers. Speed is everything, and um. And so, you know, you want to make sure it's performing, right? That they're not waiting for Firebase to sync up or something like that. Make sure there's not these really big delays. Um, so stress and load tests should be part of your, your system. Um, stress tests, you know, something for you folks to think about. How about, maybe you don't think of it as a stress, but I tell you for your apps, it could be um, where it goes offline. Like, like you lose cell phone signal for a cell data plan, or you lose Wi Fi signal in the middle of updating or something like that. What happens? Now, I don't know what is the only right thing to do, but what I know is the wrong thing to do. What you want to avoid is corruption of data for database system. You want it to fail nicely, fail gracefully, right? So, if someone loses a Wi Fi connection. You don't want it to corrupt all the data from this data collection or importantly from past data collection. You don't want it to write in some gibberish state. So so think about that as a very practical stress thing, right? Um, aspect of stress. And certainly you want, you know, if a kid at youth at risk is offline and they've requested the I don't know if, if if there's some request to them or from them, um, uh, an update to the message and model or or some notification. You need to allow for them to be offline for a while, right? This is maybe not what you normally consider a stress. You're not lowering amount of memory, but it's really important that it be able to tolerate that robustness, right? Um, so that's that's really important. Um, so I'd like to. Like to see that done. Um, uh, I will say that, like, there's some really tedious tasks which uh, automated testing can can excel at, and we'll we'll talk about them in a minute. Okay. Any final questions uh, on automated testing before I go on to this issue of testing perspectives and black box testing and, and roll out a set of techniques? No? Okay. So let's let's talk about this. Um, okay. Um, 
we can broadly divide in addition to the V model for testing, or you know, think about testing as an automated or as an annual. Another way to sort of characterize it is like what test, what's the goal of the testing? Is it to test, I had it before last time, uh, whether the design matches the requirements? Um, maybe it's for the system as a well, whole, you know, with like an acceptance test. Maybe, maybe it's for a piece of the system, like whether a given bit of code matches its specification. But does, is the design matching uh, the requirements? Um, structural test, by contrast, it actually is asking how much does the implementation match the design? You're actually looking at the details of the implementation. You're looking at the details of how it's implemented, behavioral test testing, what is being performed. Okay, you're, you're, you're testing it, it correctly correctly is true to what it's supposed to do. Whereas structural is like how um, is there the details of it how. Uh, and, and in this area, um, behavioral testing has a bunch of different things that can be applied at different levels. It can be applied at the level of user interfaces and forms that can be applied at the level of a function and at the level of a class in between and everything. Okay, so there's, there's different levels at which we can do behavioral testing. There's some different levels of structural testing. Although generally we, we do it at a lower level. We focus on, on certain areas. Okay, so black box tests, look, one of the real advantages of these, you can start planning them as soon as the requirements for that area of the program or you know, for system tests for the program as a whole are complete, right? And you don't need to be a, a uh, highly trained developer to plan this out. It's based on the requirements, right? You think through, oh, I'm going to do this use case, right? And put a place in use case, you know, test the use case. Um, doesn't require you to know, you know, red black trees and splay trees and ways to to calculate max flow of a graph or of a network. You, know, you don't have to worry about that. This is, you know, is it matching up its specs, right? think about this and brainstorm about it. Um, you don't need the code to be written. Um, and you know you can look at functionality to be exercised by common uses of it, whether it's users or things that call it. Um, so this is a set of techniques we have up here. And the main ones that um, I'm going to spend most most time on are these things so that equivalence classes. Um, kind of accompanying that is decision tables and trees which make use of these. And then things that, so these guys kind of look at, um, and they tend to look at things uh, for one input at a time or a small collection of inputs, orthogonal arrays are very clever ways of sort of varying the inputs in a really parsimonious way, meaning, um, instead of testing all combinations, we're testing a judiciously chosen subset of these. We're choosing a subset that kind of tests any pair of them fully thoroughly without testing all possible combinations. So it's a way of kind of doing a principled, thorough investigation of these things. Okay? Um, and uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit, unlikely that I'll get through all of that today, but we'll talk about random testing, testing it with random inputs. I mean, you could do this, right? For the, for the functionality of at risk use, you could have it do assessments of risk level based on random inputs, the values where you know you can cleverly choose those so that you know what the outcome should be, you know? And, you could try it with different different values, you know, older ages and younger, um, you know, male, female, you know, different uh, combinations of where they are or what have you. Um, and for the uh, entering related to childcare menus, you could you could go and 
you know, generate weights of these things randomly, right? You could generate, um, I don't know, random descriptions from a database of, of names of foods or something like that and have it record those and make sure that as you populate the database with hundreds of these things, it doesn't just give up the ghost and die or cause problems. It doesn't get really slow or what have you. Right. Okay. Um, so we're going to talk about these in this exploratory testing. Okay. Um, right. This is actually out of place, and I'm not not sure why this uh, ended up here. I wanted it to. Um, well, maybe I, maybe I will keep it here just to get you thinking about this. So um, I, I show up specification. We saw this before. I know specification. We talked about specification. I want to see specifications for areas in your program, and you can put them in place for all areas, some areas where there's some code that has to do something. Here's a specification. This one we saw just the other day, right? Um, I asked you to kind of think through what some of some good things um, that you might specify in the specification. Then I gave you a example solution, right? Okay, so there's the specification. There's the requirements for it. You know what it should do from this. You know, there's gonna be lots of details on how it does it, but you know what it should do. What what might you put in place for tests? Um for this. Give me give me some ideas. Give me some ideas. Yeah, what are the test cases or types of test cases? I just wanted to, you know, check: is this really working, or is it broken? What might you check? Eh? What might you check on this? Thing? Yeah. Name again. Right. Mark. Good. Okay, so that's a in general terms. That's what we want to do. That we want to make sure that if we test it with things that match the precondition, that it will give us a result that matches these. So that's good. Good start. But there's a lot of possibilities for the precondition of things that match these preconditions. There's a lot of kind of Particular cases where it matches these preconditions, classes of cases, groupings of cases, where it matches these preconditions um, that are kind of similar to each other. May I give me a, a sense? Because we can't check every possibility um, for things that match the preconditions. So, which one might, might what we choose to take our limited test time and use it to best advantage? Give me, yeah, uh, Jordan. Okay, yeah, yeah Jordan. Uh, maybe like how to make this part, you know, and find one of like. Good. 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 Exactly. So you have a string, maybe a um, zero length, um, and you make start and find, you'll basically span the entire length, right? And you see if it returns what? Because, okay, so what should it return? Yeah, which is the full string, right? So if you said extract string, you know, for a string of length, you know, string of length six, right? CMPT 371 or something, no, seven. Uh, CMPT is four, um, uh, length seven. And you give it the start is zero and the final is six, it should get back to CMPT 371. That's good. Um, okay, so that's good. Excellent. So there, there you've got an a, a idea for, and you described it, Jorgen, with in a, in a kind of general way. I said CMPT 371, but you described it in a more general way. It's sort of a, a class of these things where you have some string. 
and it's best when I start and final to kind of span the full string, uh, the full length. Of it. That's great. And to turn it into a specific test case, a specific test case, I would need to specify a specific value for this. And what would be implied was then what start and final. That would be a test case, a very specific test case. Great. So now give me another one. We're going to start us off in the right direction. Give me another one that you might test. So if you only wrote that, what, what might fall through the cracks? Suppose you wrote that and you say, mm -mm, this passes, great. Like, could there still be bugs in this? Okay, tell me like something that was not included in Jorgens that might show a type of bug in this, or a, you know, what sort of bugs might have gotten through? Give me, give me a case that might, might get them out. Or allow us to identify. Yes, the reason. Um, I was in the one that has um, start that's not at the very beginning to end at the very end to make sure it's a happy one. Good. Good. So maybe we do CMPT 371, and we have the start B1. That's not zero, right? Um, and, and this should say mumble, it should say uh, zero. Okay, it should have said, you know, oh yeah, zero indicates the first character, yeah. Um, so maybe start as one and maybe final as three, right? Um, but again, I like how you've described it because you described the class of these things. This, I'm picking one and three, but that, that's just me. I'm, I'm pinning it down to a particular case, but you specify a whole set of cases. And, and this is gonna get to the point of the, Coming up, both of you exactly picked up. So the string here might be CMP D371 with no space. The start is one, the end is three, right? And so you've got basically MPT. Hmm. It should give back MPT for that case, right? So you can test that, right? Excellent. Um, uh, okay, if we put that into place, is that it? Is, is, could there be another bug? Yeah. So like yeah, when I'm in the end, the top one gets to the string. Yeah. And the string starts to be zero. Yeah. And string length will be one. Or like string length will be one to begin with string length minus one, or in the final will be zero. Uh okay. So start is zero, final is zero, and then the string. String and the string is a single character. So it's a lot character. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. Um so so we'd be extracting just the single character in the string, right? Um, so I um, wonder if I should walk out. Um, so uh, if we do that, we should get back this, the same character that's in the string, right? Um, and that would be a good thing to test. There might be a bug which doesn't handle start equal to final, right? Maybe there's something in there which is counting on um, them being different. And um, and here they are, in fact, um, the same. So you're testing that. You're ferreting out some to make sure there's not a silly type of bug in here. Because off by one errors, cases where someone is off by a single character are one of the most common types of errors. They were when I was a young man, when I was your age, and then they are when I'm an old man. Um, they will be when I'm an old man. Um, um, so that's a good, good type. Um, you might pick up on that theme and suggest some more, but we're picking up classes of things here. We're picking up sort of groupings of these that are in some sense similar. And we call those equivalence classes, okay? And the idea is, look, we can't test everything. I mean, almost none of the time can you test something exhaustively, like every single case. So you figure out, you know, um, these kind of classes of these, where if you deal with one of those, you probably ruled out a bug that's going to affect the other two. So you, you kind of say, look, you know, there are these groups of them that are kind of similar, because like, 
It doesn't matter for Trenton's example if it's C is the only character in it, or M, or T, or U, or whatever. Whatever that character is, we have something that is, you know, start and finally plus zero. Or same thing with Jordan's example. Same thing with Larissa's example. Lots of particular values, but look, if we test one of them, we probably ruled out a whole set of different, you know, similar examples that none of which are going to have problems either. So we sort of go in and we, we rule out types of bugs or, or types of reasoning that give rise to bugs. Yeah. So the idea here is like characterizing the foothold's custom. So suppose you're booking a flight in an airplane, right? Um, you're, or you're responsible for an airplane reservations. Years back uh, in the 90s, I was approached about serving as one of the, essentially the co-founders of a company that you folks may know called orbits.com. And uh, it's one of the biggest travel sites now for booking flight reservations. And uh, I turned it down. Um, and um, I think the people approached me about it who I knew are billionaires now, but um, yeah, what can I say? Um, uh, so um, not, my, not my last chance at, at billions. Um, uh, so, here, um, like with a booking system, you might have coach class and you know business class as the two compartments. So maybe on some flights, long haul flights are received the first class, business class, and coach class. Or something. That would be one type of division. But that's not all. What's another type of division you might get get here as well? In terms of you know broad divisions of seats. So that might be one way to sort of classify. Look, we want at least one coach class. We want to try it with a coach class example. We want to try it with a first class and try it with a business class if there is, you know, depending on which of the are present. But what other things might we try? What are some? Yeah, exactly. Like, is it a central? Is it an aisle seat? Is it a middle seat? And maybe you want to check that, like, here, the first class cabin only has two seats apart. So you can't, you shouldn't be presented with an option and it should flag as, you know, um, not viable, an option of requesting like a middle seat in the first class cabin, right? But that doesn't make sense. Um, and similarly, maybe over, over wing things or what have you, there's, there's certain restrictions. So the idea here is, look, when you have these equivalence classes, um, you find these broad categories here, like first versus business versus coach, and then crossed with sort of all, all pairs of that with whether it's window, aisle, or middle seat, for example, if they are appropriate. And, and then you, you, for each of those categories, that like combination, you, you draw a single representative at least. But, um, it's not that if you do that, you're going to completely test this exhaustively. That's not the point, though. The point is that how could you even claim that you've tested the system if you haven't tested at least one first class with an aisle seat or something like that? I mean, could you really stand in front of something and say, I'm sure this is going to work? Not reasonable, right? Like you don't really have it. Um, and um, you know, you have to you want to consider here both both valid and invalid cases. I said that, like you want to consider like you know a first class seat where you're trying to say I want the the middle the middle seat. You know, does it allow that, etc. Right? Um, uh, okay, so. Um, for a square root function, what would you put into place? Give me some ideas for square root. Suppose there's a function that takes double precision numbers and it returns a double precision number as a square root of the one you gave it. What, what are some equivalence classes you try it with? Yeah, Lisa. Yeah, okay. You give it a negative number and hopefully it should return some sort of error. Now, this is a little bit tricky. Because it depends kind of on your semantics of um, of preconditioning. It's like if if the code, if the routine says as a precondition, it has to be greater than zero. 
you can't expect it but by, by many accounting secretaries you shouldn't be expecting it to match the post -it. as mark said earlier the precondition the post conditions are guaranteed if if the preconditions are met but if they're not met you, you shouldn't be counting on the post conditions oh. on the other hand you might have a policy say in your deputy that if the preconditions are not met you should signal that because it's a probably a programming error right and one of the most common ways to signal that during development and testing is what through the use of yeah, logging and accompanying that logging and supporting it is something that begins with an A. Assertions. Assertion. Wow. You're really good at hanging. That's, that's awesome. Um, yeah, so assertions. So normally your code would assert that the precondition is met. Like the code for the thing that you called would say, hey, for the world to be sane, you have to be giving me something that meets my precondition. And it and as an assertion that tests that, right? And, and if it's not the case, it says, whoa, someone's coming on me doing something for an invalid case. Uh, that's what the assertion and it logs it. Um and and typically it bombs up, you know, it, 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 or or at least sig signals its unhappiness in some notable way. Um but the point is that. You should be testing to make sure it behaves reasonably for these classes. So, so negative numbers would be a good example of where it would probably violate its precondition, and we want to make sure it's caught, right? That it just isn't like silent death, that it, it just returns high, you know, when we get a negative number or something. Um, okay, so what's another class with, with Scarborough? Yeah, yeah. That's another class of the square root. Okay, like a maximum double. Maximum possible double. Yeah. And where we'll take the square root of it, so it'll be smaller and make sure it handles the maximum. Yeah. Not a bad idea. Those boundary values, we'll come back to them. It's really important cases. What other boundary value might there be that's legitimate? Because it should handle square root as big as possible double we can represent in a double. Um that's kind of redundant, but um but it should also handle what? What's a legitimate one? Yes, Larissa. Give it zero. Right? Zero is a unusual number to take the square root of at, at a mathematical level. It's it's a fixed one for square root. Not the only thick one. What's another thick one? What's another number you give it if you give the same number back? One, one, give it one. Yeah, zero and one are great. Okay. Um, what else might we give it though? What what would be a really easy thing to check? If you were deaf and you were doing this by hand, what would be a really easy type of thing to check? Yeah, please. Exactly. Yeah, perfect square. The perfect square. So sixteen, right? Uh, give it, give it nine, right? Um, give it four. That, that's a really good, good example. So that's that's a class. And what's what's another class? Well, something that's positive but not a perfect square. You want to make sure, like, you give it something that's not a perfect square. It also gives three squares. And in fact, this is really something that's pretty easy to check, right? Because like square root involves long, many operations, but whatever answer it gives, you can square it and check, like, is it the same as what I passed in, right? But at least you want to, like, if there's a bug in that code, it would probably be turned up by, by running these sort of, at least one example of each of these classes. It would probably, there's a good chance it would show up. If you pick some number that's a perfect square, something you try it with zero and, and try it with things less than zero for errors, because we like to try it with things that are not valid, and things less than one and, 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 and greater than one in your terms, you could try it with 
with integers, you know, that other than perfect squares. Um, probably a look, you haven't tested it perfectly, but you probably ruled out big classes of errors, right? Would have to be pretty subtly screwed up if it passes all of these and it's correct for all of these, but you know, the, for the ones you pick, but somehow at 32,000, you know, 367, it gives a wacko number. It can happen. I don't rule that out, but um, seems seems less likely, right? Um, okay. Um, there was a case of an Intel chip, I think. I think it was the 386SX. Maybe I, I can't remember. Anyway, I had a floating point. Bug that only manifested for like certain really weird cases, and you could call up like a calculator and do it, and it would show the error. It was like it was very, it was very obvious if you knew like the right range of numbers to draw, it'll be whacked, whacked out, and um, that was really tricky, uh, especially those depending on the engineering company. Uh, they put out a fix, um, yeah, um, okay, so. You know, so if someone enter now, this could be applied. So I said square root function. I ain't gonna give you that example, but this could be applied. The sort of reasoning could be applied for, for like a web form or a form on an app, right? A, a mobile app, right? Where someone has to enter a number, and maybe the the, the valid ones are between one and ninety nine, and so you give some number between them, and then you try it with invalid numbers, just as Louisa said. Um, look, um, pre when preconditions are not met, we want a signal because it's a pro it's a developer, right? We want a signal, hey, somewhere in the team, something's broken because you're calling this with something that it shouldn't be expected to, to handle. So you want to alert one of the developers that, look, this is not being used properly, right? You're passing it a null and it doesn't take nulls. Right. Yeah. But when you're dealing with end users, you can't say like you're not allowed to do that. And you know, it will be like you you can't count in the system if you enter the wrong number in here. Um and so maybe this expects an age between one and 99 and someone enters zero or something like that, or someone enters a hundred, you can't say like you are invalid, you know, um, you know, go and go off and, you know, hide or something like that. You can't say that to a user. You have to handle gracefully whatever they do. You have to help educate them or, or warn them or tell them, look, you know, something is off. Um, this has to be in this room. But you can't just ignore it, and you can't just have the system crash, right? You can't have it do a stack dump as <laughs> you're out of luck. Um, there was a case, this is a true story. Um, so, um, I remember in the first Mac, I interacting with the first Mac, um, and I was about your age when that happened. Um, and I knew some of the development team that worked to build some of the first software, like itself, for the first app, for the first Mac. Right? Um, but uh, with that Mac, there were it was a lot less sophisticated than today's Mac, sure. and uh, it had some really endearing attributes. But um, it had a it had a really quite a, an operating system that it got increasingly bad. It would crack. It would crash sometimes spontaneously or sometimes at certain times and it would throw up these icons and to computer people the icons were kind of amusing and they elicited a grim but it, it showed like a, a a bomb with like a, a, a rip coming out of it like an old style cannonball type bomb or something and with like a wick with like sparks on it and, and you know it said like you know, this crash, reboot your Mac, or something like that. But if a bunch of end users saw this, were guess what? Not computer people, because the Mac was sold to the people who didn't want to be computer people. Like they wanted to get work done and stuff like that. They weren't just 
techno geeks. Um, uh, and and it really freaked them out. And there were reports, genuinely, calls into Apple, quite a few of them, as I understand, which basically said, like, it said it was gonna blow up, you know, <laughs> my back was gonna, my back said it was gonna explode. It said, you know, there was a bomb. <laughs> I was gonna turn into a bomb because I did something wrong or something like that. They got really distressed because they like fled their house. And they, you know, this is the day before cell phones. They have to go to a phone booth or something that said, like, my house is my house gonna be destroyed? You know, is it gonna blow up? Um, they told me it was gonna blow up. Why did it say it was gonna blow up? Um, anyway, they were unhappy. Yeah. Um, so so equivalence classes here, you know, you want to give some. You want to test it with all sorts of invalid things. And like a user might might reasonably try something 99 because maybe they're you know they're entering it for someone who's a centenarian, someone who's really old. Um or they enter five minus five or something like that, or they try entering a negative number because it doesn't apply to them or something like that, or they enter letters or whatever you enter O instead of zero, or they enter I instead of one or L or whatever. And, and you want to make sure it handles that gracefully, right? The first letter of the name, maybe, maybe if the first character is not a letter, it's a tick mark or whatever is going to occur in certain languages. And, um, and you want to try it for valid inputs, like where it's upper and lower case, et cetera. So the point is you're thinking about these equivalence classes, and for each of them, you want to pick a representative. Like if you want to pick one of these, one of these, one of these, one of these, you want to try at least one because it may show a whole classes of errors where it's not here. That is all for today, but we're going to be expanding on this with some examples and some some sort of trying things out. And we're going to be going on to talk about what's called boundary value testing, which builds on equivalent classes to test extreme cases because often it's in those extremes that problem solve. Okay. Um, and then we'll talk about some, some more types of ways of picking tests cleverly to really push the system to see if it's hanging together. Okay. That's all for today. Thank you very much. I have office hours now as always, and um, try to talk to them. Thank you.